Good morning. Good morning. No, not good enough. It's supposed to be 70 today, so that means good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <sighs> I'm tired. So a lot happening. First and foremost, we have our guest speaker, Casey Moore. Okay. Wave. Yay. Thank you for being here, sir. Um, Elder of the week is Dwight. Yay. How you doing? Fine. Fine? Yeah. Just fine. His number's in the bulletin. Please call it a lot. Uh, we do have a Hooray for Spring event happening here in a few weeks. Ramona, go ahead and come on up and tell us all about it. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a beautiful day to be worshiping you together, isn't it? I just want to call your attention to the insert that's in your bulletin about our Hooray for Spring event on Saturday, March the 25th at 6 o'clock here at the church. Um, college age and up are invited. Cost is $12.50 a person. Um, we'll have some wonderful food. We'll have some wonderful entertainment, and we'll have some wonderful fellowship. So um, you may either pay um, Marta, and I don't think Marta's here today, or Vicki Brinkley, who has her hand up back there, or if you want to just put it in an envelope and put it in the offering box in the foyer, be sure to mark it that it's for the Hooray for Spring event so that they know what to credit it to. And looking forward to seeing everybody there. It is communion day, so if you have not gotten your little cups, they are out in the foyer. Um, there will be evening services for both, Mr. Scott, Brent, yes, and then of course for teens also. And lastly, Bob and Helen Watson, raise your hands. Raise your hands, you two. Their uh, anniversary is on Wednesday, the 8th, and six, go ahead. <laughs> And if you are under, under the age of 65, raise your hand. Hi. They've been married longer than that, or will be 65 years. That is awesome. 65 years. We will be having a reception next Sunday after church that everyone's invited to attend to because it's right after church with cake. So um, awesome. Continue. Um, you are an inspiration to all of us. 65 wonderful years. So with that, have... I have nothing else to say, I'm super tired, so welcome to Bethel. Good morning to all, let's all stand, we'll get started. We're gonna start with an old hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Everlasting arms. 
going to do a new song this morning. We want to introduce a new song to the congregation. Some of you may uh, know this song if you know of Brooke Lit Litgertwood is her na last name. Uh, she's sung this on, out there on the radio in different places. <clears throat> it's got great words to it. Katie's going to lead it for you this morning. If you know the song, we'd ask you to go ahead and join in. If you don't, we're going to sing it again after the prayer, and we're going to have you join in at that time. So listen to the melody, learn the song if you don't currently know it, so you can join in with praise the next time we do it today.
Who's got prayer? <clears throat> started doing the sticks. I thought there was going to be another song, Dwight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Katie, for leading us in that and our hearts and worship this morning. Uh, as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, I want to highlight a couple of things that uh, we encourage you as a body of believers to be praying for this week. Uh, you have them in your bulletin on the green sheet, uh, but just uh, a couple things I want to add to that. Um, remember Michelle Walker, she was in the hospital this past week. Uh, it was more of a preventative, but um, uh, just continue to pray for the wisdom. The doctors can kind of figure out what's going on with her heart. Uh, I know she's back home. She's on some medication uh, from what uh, Glenna Smith, I don't know if Glenn and Donna are here this morning. Oh, yep, I see him in the back. So, oh, and there she is, Michelle. So we'll continue to be praying for Michelle in this. Um, and then our search committee is, will be meeting again this coming Tuesday and just continue to pray for guidance and wisdom, patience, discernment, all the things that go into uh, searching and praying for um, a next senior pastor. Um, we want to remember our missionary of the week uh, this week, the Stitts, Willis and Nisa Stitt, and their ministry in Brazil. And then also, Furnace will be having a new grandbaby here, hopefully in a couple weeks, right? Uh, so uh, continue to pray for Marina, and then we'll also continue to pray for uh, Cassidy. It should be here in a couple weeks as well. I know, I saw. I think I saw Cassidy. There she is, yeah. I keep praying on March 30th, my birthday, Cassidy. <laughs> Her due date's the 29th, so. Uh. And then a couple things I want to add to this. Um, Carol Bainham, I think I did see her. She is still planning on leaving, I believe, for Texas today. Is that correct? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. So just, okay. So uh, just pray for her visit. She'll be visiting with her daughter. And uh, if you remember kind of the past history, uh, the daughter's husband passed away, correct? About January. back in January. She's yeah, so there's some memory, some mental issues, I think, with, with that. So just pray that God can use Carol during that time with family. And um, she shared with me a little bit. It's, it's tough. It's going to be tough for her. So just uh, she needs God's peace and strength in that um, as she goes down to Texas this week. And then just uh, we want to also prepare our hearts for communion this morning as well. So as we remember and celebrate what uh, Christ did for us, if we our believers and have put our faith and trust and salvation in him alone uh, we get to celebrate uh, that uh, this morning during communion so let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer Lord you are a great God and we are so thankful that <clears throat> we get to celebrate father uh, this morning we get to celebrate that uh, you love us because you sent your one and only son Jesus to this earth to uh, to die for the sin of the world, Lord, and uh, you've promised us not just a uh, eternal life, but Lord, you've promised us a relationship with you through your son, Jesus, if we put our faith and trust and believe in that. And so, Lord, we uh, thank you that we're able to remember um, as one of our ordinances here at Bethel uh, of just uh, and to celebrate um, uh, your son's death on the cross, Lord, by taking communion. So, Lord, we just ask for uh, our hearts to be prepared for that. Lord, we also think about uh, the request uh, that I mentioned, Father, uh, earlier. We lift all those up to you this morning, uh, Lord, and uh, we know that um, you are the great physician. We know that you hear our prayers, Father, and you answer our prayers. And we've already seen that by... Uh, praising you that uh, with uh, <clears throat> the Watsons and be them being here this morning, Lord, and, and just uh, we, we are so grateful for that. And to see a smile on her face, Father, this morning after everything that she's been through and that she's going through with uh, her heart surgery. And, and so, Lord, we just are, are uh, so grateful and just praise you for that this morning for this family. Lord, I just want to lift up uh, Brother Casey, Father, to you this morning. Uh, I know that... Uh, uh, he was here uh, many years ago, and uh, but uh, I know, Lord, you're going to use him this morning in a mighty way. You're going to speak through him, Lord. So uh, I ask that you would prepare 
not just Casey's heart, Father, as he gives the word, but prepare our hearts to receive that. Um, Lord, we know that uh, um, through your word, lives can be changed. And so we're grateful that uh, Casey will be uh, speaking and preaching those uh, truths of your word, Father, here, not just this week, but next week as well. Lord, just give us a, a good rest of the service. Um, Lord, as we continue in worship, Father, and we give you the honor and praise, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Okay, we're going to have you sing the song that we just sang with us. So if you'll all stand, it's your opportunity to sing this song in worship to Christ. I like one of the concepts that it brings out in the song. It's something I'd never thought about before. We always talk about how Christ has done so much for us that there's no way that we can repay. But in the song, there's a line that says, we'll have eternity to try. I think that's pretty cool.
You may be seated. Good morning. This is the part of the service where we'll go to communion now. Um, just a quick reminder, uh, this is the Lord's Supper or Lord's Table. This isn't uh, Bethel's Table. It's the Lord's Table. So if, uh, if you've put your uh, faith in Christ and He's your Savior and Lord, uh, we invite you to uh, join with us this morning. Um, when you walked in, there was these little cups. If you didn't get one, uh, raise your hand, and it looks like uh, we've got a... Um, a couple people to bring, bring cups around. Just a reminder, uh, communion is a reverent time, not something to be taken casually, uh, but we do this in remembrance of Christ. As Paul says in Corinthians 11.29, uh, for whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So this is a time where we... Um, uh, recognize the work of Christ on the cross and, uh, um, and, and what he's done for us. So as we do this, uh, let's take a moment to um, spend time with God, just you and God uh, by yourself in, in your seat there and uh, examine our hearts and prepare us for, uh, for this communion. Our Heavenly Father, please work in each of our hearts uh, to draw us to you. Um, search us and know us, Lord. Uh, reveal to us the things that are, are, have come between us and you that, that hinder our relationship and um, the, the, uh, the distractions of this world that uh, cause us to take our eyes off of you. Um, as we're reminded of your son's work on the cross, uh, help us to grasp uh, the significance, uh, the weight of his sacrifice for us. Um, it's hard to fathom, Jesus, what you went through, um, just, just for us to have a relationship. Uh, your love is, is undeserving, yeah, yet it's most beautiful. And so we thank you for redeeming us and, and pulling, us, pulling us out of darkness uh, and into your light. Amen. Communion is also a time of expectant celebration. Um, uh, Joel touched on that just a minute ago um, as we await the return of Christ. Uh, this is to be done in celebration. Um, Hebrews 9, 28 says, So also Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So as we partake, let us fix our eyes on Christ and, and look towards the day he will come again. Um, on the top side, bottom side, uh, is the little wafer. Um, if you want to prepare that, uh, and I'll read this. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul states, For what I received from the Lord I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he, when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat together. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Uh, I wanna quickly just remind you of the benevolence fund that we have here at Bethel. Um, to help, help people out financially, um, members of our church or those in the community that have financial needs. So uh, you can give through the donation box in the back, online or through the app. 
and just designate the gift towards the benevolence fund. Um, thank you. Good morning. Welcome to Bethel. Whether you're worshiping with us online or in person, we invite you to fill out our online connect card at www.betheltopeka.org forward slash connect or fill out one of the connect cards in front of you. Thank you for joining us. It's a joy to see a lot of kids get up, huh? Amen? <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, just a reminder, Daylight Savings, we spring forward next Sunday. So if you don't, you'll be late. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's an honor to be able to um, uh, introduce uh, Casey uh, to you this morning. If you've been around for about seven years, Casey filled in when uh, Pastor Jim retired uh, a few times, and um, so we're glad to have him back. Uh, just a little background, uh, Casey moved to Topeka in 2006. Uh, he was hired on as an associate pastor at Topeka Bible Church. Uh, he's a civil engineer by trade, uh, so I'm a little biased because my dad was that he married a Shawnee County girl, uh, and I just found out her, her name was her name is Jamie Powell was her maiden name. Um, and I think Dwight, you asked this. Uh, there are two big Powell families. She there's no relation. There's a Powell family that has a lot of boys, and a Powell family that has a lot of girls. She's part of the girl fa family. <laughs> so, um, so Casey says now that he's married a Topeka girl, he's stuck in Kansas. Welcome to my world back in 95 when I moved here, my friend. Uh, they have three children, Clara, Jackson, and Miriam. And I know that Clara is in Ian's class at Heritage Christian. Nathan's class. I'm sorry, Nathan's class in, at Heritage Christian. So, uh, so we are excited to have Casey uh, here with us the next couple of weeks. So uh, I appreciate it if you guys give him a warm Bethel welcome as he comes up and shares a word this morning. Good morning. Last month, a teacher in Hiawatha noticed something unusual. He looked up into the Kansas blue sky, 50,000 feet up in the sky, there was this big white object. All over the United States of America, what is this thing? Started off the first sighting in Montana, then down here to uh, Nebraska, northeast Kansas. Some said, oh, it's a weather balloon. National Weather Service said, no, it's not our weather balloon. Others said, it's a balloon from the Chinese. It's a surveillance balloon. The Chinese said, no, it's not a surveillance balloon, but it is a weather craft that has just gone off course. What you think about this story, this white air balloon story, uh, that's between you and who knows, you know, you and your family. It's a personal matter. I've got my opinions, but we're not going to talk about that this morning. Even though it's a matter of national security, what we think about that story doesn't matter too much. But when it comes to matters of things of uh, matters of faith, uh, eternal security, those things do matter. Uh, we must be united on things of extreme importance like the cross. And it's been so great to be here this morning listening to the songs you sing, even seeing the architecture of this building, how you have the cross uh, center, centered here behind me. This church obviously values the cross. And what a wonderful thing that is. But what do you do with the cross? With the story of a Jewish man 2,000 years ago, who hung on the cross in Jerusalem, who suffered and died. What do you do with that story? Church, you need to be united on this subject. How do you prioritize the message of the cross and everything you do in your ministries? 
many things that you can do as a church, many ways that you can show God's love to this world and this community. And there are a lot of people out there, a contemporary culture that's going to come in to the church, the Christian church wants to give you a new ideas on how you can reach this community. Church growth consultants are quick to come in and tell you what you must do. How far are you willing to go from the cross, to deviate from the message of the cross to reach this community? How far are you willing to deviate from the message of the cross to show a lost and dying world God's love? Understanding how you answer that question is massive and how you do church and how you even lead and live your personal life. Go, to, go downtown Topeka, Washburn University, 17th Street, head west, and you'll see flags in front of a church. That's one answer to the question. Go online, Google, uh, Voice of the Martyrs, you know, read stories of persecuted believers. That's another answer to the question, what do you do as an individual, and what does this church do with the message of the cross? That's the subject this morning. How do you respond? What do you do with the cross? We'll focus on one verse and one passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll read verses 18 through 25. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Verse 20. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We ask that you give us grace this morning to receive your truth. Please lead us and guide us by your spirit, Lord. May we be sensitive to the work of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, first you'll see that the word of the cross is folly to the lost. Then you'll see that the word of the cross is power to the saved. And then we'll mention two things. Uh, you'll be challenged to do two different things concerning this word of the cross. Before we dive into that, let's talk about the context of this passage You'll see that verse 18 starts with a conjunction that's translated for. A, a familiar passage, John 3.16, starts with that same conjunction, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever, whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That coordinate conjunction translated for ties this verse in John 3.16 back to the prior passage where John compares Moses lifting up a serpent to the, in the wilderness to the Son of Man who would be lifted up. The same conjunction translated for in John 3.16 appears in 1 Corinthians 1.18. That conjunction ties this passage to the previous context. So let's look at that. Uh, go back to 1 Corinthians 1. You see that the writer was addressing divisions in the church. The Apostle Paul had planted a church in Corinth a few years prior to him writing this letter. And at this point, he's on his third missionary journey in Ephesus and receives a letter about divisions, issues in the church. And we see in this passage that there was there a certain group of people, Chloe's people, sent him this letter. And Chloe's people said there was quarreling among the people of the church. Some were saying, I follow Paul. Others were saying, I follow Apollos. Others, Cephas. 
Some were even saying, I follow Christ. And Paul's response was rhetorical. Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Verse 14, he said, I thank God that I did not baptize any of you. That sounds harsh, doesn't it? Why would the Apostle Paul be thankful that he didn't baptize anyone in the church of Corinth? Well, he explains that in verse 15, so that no one may say you were baptized in my name. Uh, Paul understood that there were divisions in the church based upon who was following whom. Just imagine if he had actually baptized people. My goodness, everyone would be saying, I follow Paul, I follow Paul. He's so smart, he's so wise, I follow Paul. We don't do that in the local church today, do we? <laughs> follow this pastor, that pastor, this preacher, that preacher. Paul tells the first century church, he says, enough of that, stop it. Verse 17, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to what? But to preach. Preach the gospel. And Paul reminded his audience that he preached the gospel. And when he preached the gospel, he did not use words of eloquent wisdom. Now, Paul, while educated, in some way, he didn't lean on eloquent words uh, that were common among these uber-successful businessmen of Corinth. There were all these businessmen that owned these ships and ports. They were responsible for getting cargo from one port to the other. Lots of money, successful people, the Corinth Gulf uh, to the west, Saronic Gulf to the east. These people of power and wealth and influence, they did not flock to Paul. The words he chose were common words, not words, not words of eloquent wisdom that would attract large crowds. Now, why didn't Paul speak using eloquent words of wisdom? If he did use these words that attracted crowds, people would look to him instead of looking to Christ. And that's his idea in this passage. While in Ephesus, Paul had this letter sent to him and Chloe's people, he read, he could see that the culture of Corinth was contaminating the Christian church in Corinth. Corinth, what was acceptable in big city life, the same as our New York City or Las Vegas, was becoming acceptable in the church. The culture began to percolate into the church. People of the church began to mirror the culture instead of mirroring the, the cross of Christ. What are you doing, church? Paul says, arguing over Paul, Apollo, Cephas, Christ. What are you doing, church? Allowing issues of incest, lawsuits, sexual immorality, marriage and divorce, what you eat, what you don't eat, what you wear, what you don't wear, all these cultural issues coming into the church. What are you doing, church? So keep all that context as to what was happening in the church at Corinth in mind as we look at this passage. And answer the question, what do you do with the cross? So reading right from verse 18, you see first that the word of the cross is folly to the lost. So this phrase, the word of the cross, contains two words, the word and the cross. The word translated uh, word is from logos, Greek word, used several times, over 300 times in the New Testament. The gospel writer John used it in 1-1, in the beginning was the word. In that sense, John was using the word to refer to Jesus. And some scholars apply that same interpretation to this passage, but more commonly used, the word refers to words, uh, message, words that were spoken, speech, something that someone has said. And I think Paul is using the same idea here. The words that he spoke about the cross. Instead of the word of the cross, some of your translations may say something like a message of the cross, the preaching of the cross. The idea is exactly the same. All those translations were just saying uh, the word, the message that was taught by Paul about the cross. He means the words that he spoke about the cross. Now this cross, we could talk about that. One scholar, one source says the cross was a well-known instrument of most cruel punishment to the worst of criminals. Borrowed from the Greeks and the Romans, uh, it was used to kill, punish criminals 
slaves, robbers, insurrectionists. Now, details about the cross, what type of wood it was, the, the actual dimensions, how far it stuck into the ground. Those details can be gleaned from history, but Paul, when he references the cross, he's referencing the teaching that Christ died so that you may live. The word of the cross in 1 Corinthians 1.18 refers to the gospel message. And this gospel that Paul explains in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the truth that Christ died according to scriptures, he was buried and he rose again according to scriptures. Nothing complicated. Christ died, he was buried and he rose again. The gospel, Christ died and rose again. The gospel is the word of the cross. Verse 18, Paul says the gospel, the word of the cross is folly. Foolishness. The original word translated folly is moria in the Greek. It comes from the uh, root of moros. We get our English word moron from this root. Stupid or foolish. That's the idea here, that in the New Testament, in Paul's writings, those who have not yet been saved who are lost, look at the cross and say, it's stupid, it's foolishness. The natural person, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. He's unable to understand them, for they are spiritually discerned. The natural person views the word of the cross as moronic, foolish, or stupid. You catch the significance of that? The person who is lost looks at the cross as foolishness. Paul reminds his audience at the beginning of this letter that those who are spiritually lost want nothing to do with the cross. They want nothing to do with Jesus who died so that they may live. The word of the cross is foolishness to them. Find someone who's outspokenly anti-God and they'll be quick to say, Christianity is foolish. It's stupid. They may even say that about you because you believe it. In verse 18, Paul refers to this group of people who view the word of the cross as folly, as those who are what? Perishing. It's a participle translated uh, uh, perishing from apollomi. Short definition is to fully destroy. This word, Apollo, me, appears in Matthew 2.13. The wise men visited Jesus. He was just a child, and they fell down and worshipped Jesus, offered gifts to Jesus. And when they, they departed, an angel of the Lord appeared to Jesus, Joseph in a dream. He said, rise, take up the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, remain there, because Herod, he is coming, he's searching for the child to destroy him. Matthew also uses this verb in um, chapter 9, verse 17. Neither is new wine put in old wineskins, for if it is, the old wineskins burst. The wine spilled out and the old wineskins are destroyed. In the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all use this word as well in the same story. The disciples are at sea, there's a storm, and they're feeling, fearing for their life with high winds, big waves, and Jesus is sleeping. And they wake him up, they say, Jesus, we are perishing. Don't you care that we're perishing? 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul uses that root word to describe those who are lost. This middle voice used by Paul draws attention to the fact that the subject experiences this action that's expressed by the verb. While already spiritual de spiritually dead, those people who view the cross as folly, as foolishness, they're marching toward their eternal death. They're like disciples, stuck on a ship in a stormy sea, yet they have no awareness that their end is near. They're like young boys of Bethlehem, two and a half years or younger, waiting for Herod's men to come and destroy them. Those who are perishing are like old wineskins, ready to burst. 
Look upon the cross, you who are perishing. Jesus died and rose again. He's waiting for you to turn your heart to Jesus. When you turn your life to him, believe in Jesus, he'll rebuke the winds, rebuke the seas, and bring a spiritual calm in your life, such that in in your soul you know I have been saved. But until God grants grace to those who are perishing, they will not turn to the cross. They will laugh at the word of the cross. They will call Christians stupid because the word of the cross is folly to them. Is that heavy? The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Second, the word of the cross is power to those who are being saved. Now, this word translated power in verse 18, it's from the Greek word dunamis. You've heard that many times, I'm sure. Strength, ability, and power. One source specifies this term as inherent power. Power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. Uh, Dunamis here in this text is paired with a genitive noun translated of God. That tells us that this power is God's power, which becomes efficacious in the lives of those who believe in Jesus. This phrase translated, those who are being saved, comes from the participle, participle sozo. It means to save in a biblical sense, the technical sense, to save from messianic judgment. As humans, we enter this world with inherited sin, separated from God. But God allows us to hear this gospel. He draws us to himself. And his power works in us, such that he sets us free from sin, gives us new life. We hear the gospel, and for whatever reason, we don't see it as foolishness, but we fall on our face and say, God, I need you. I need you, Jesus. We turn from ourselves and face Jesus by believing in him. And then our spiritual life begins. Later in 1 Corinthians 15, too, Paul reminded his audience about this present reality of salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, 2, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you in the past, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. In our current spiritual status as Christians who are being saved, the gospel is the power of God that becomes efficacious in us. The gospel is God's power, which has a real tangible effect on our lives. Yeah, we're justified by grace through faith. Sometime in the past when we believed in Jesus, we were declared righteous. But now we are in process, growing spiritually. We are being saved. None of us have arrived spiritually. We are growing, being saved as we cooperate with God's power in us. We cooperate with the Spirit of God. Paul opened his letter to 1 Thessalonians in the same way. 1 Thessalonians 1.5, our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. You know the verse Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for everyone who believes. Without God's power working in us, none of us would have believed. None of us would have been saved. This act of turning from ourselves, own self-reliance, and looking to God, falling on our face before him, we could not do that apart from God's power. So thank God the power of the gospel worked in our lives. Thank God that the power of the gospel continues to work in us. So church, be careful that you don't look to the wisdom of the world to tackle spiritual issues when you should be looking to the gospel. Be careful that you don't look to man-made formulas for spiritual success when you should be looking to the gospel. Yesterday, the Jerusalem Post shared this article about an, as an update on the sacred oil that's going to be used to anoint King Charles at his coronation in May. Now, Buckingham Palace said that King Charles has family ties to the Mount of Olives. So guess what? They've got oil from the Mount of Olives. And this oil has been perfumed with sesame, rose, jasmine, cinnamon, neroli, benzoin, and orange blossom, if I'm saying all that correctly. Now, there's a place for tradition. There may be health benefits for oil, I don't know. But if we're looking to anything that's man-made for spiritual power, you're missing the cross. You've missed the mark. 
you've missed the gospel. The word of the cross, not oil sprinkled with seeds and flowers and tree bark. The word of the cross is the power of God for those who are being saved. The word of the cross, not anything that we can make with our hands or think in our minds. The word of the cross is the power of God. Verse 24, 1 Corinthians, Paul uses this word translated called. This word means invited. One Greek lexicon says that in the New Testament, people of the church have been invited by God in proclamation of the gospel to obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God through Christ. God has called believers in this room and across the world into relationship with himself. God has called believers into the church. So this idea of being called by God appears several times in 1 Corinthians leading up to our passage. Chapter 1 alone, verse 2, called to be saints. Verse 9, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son. Verse 24, to those who are called the same word called appears in Romans 1.7 and Romans 8.28. Those who have been called by God are those who are being saved by God. Now, the Apostle Paul, what we've seen and throughout his letters, teaches there's a difference between the natural person, he or she who is lost, and the spiritual person, he or she who has been called and saved. Those who are called, the same word, those who believe, who have received the power of God. The natural person hears the gospel, hears it in their heart, and they throw themselves upon Jesus. The spiritual person does that. The natural person hears the gospel, Maria, foolishness, stupid. How do we know among those who are not saved at the moment? How do we know who is going to one day call upon Jesus in saving faith? How do we know who God's working in? Well, we don't, do we? We're not God. We don't know. We know he's worked in our lives. We know he's worked in the lives of those who are close to us. But we don't know who he's going to save and who he won't. That's, that's why we keep the cross central to everything we do. Keep preaching the word of God. Keep pointing people to the word of the cross. Build our ministries. Build our lives on the cross. The big idea of this message could, could be something like, God calls, we don't. Therefore, trust God to change lives through the gospel. God calls, we don't. Therefore, trust God to change lives through the gospel. We're going to be so tempted to be creative and bring in consultants who tell us what to do with the church. Forget it. Preach the gospel. The word of the cross is folly to the lost. They'll always look at it and say it's foolish until God's grace works in them. But to us who have believed, it is the power of God. What do you do with the cross as a church? And as an individual. 1 Corinthians 1.21, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who what? Who believe. 1 Corinthians 1.21, who will be saved? Those who believe. Verses 22 and 23 tell us that the Jews demanded signs and the Greeks sought worldly wisdom. But Paul preached the simple message of a crucified Messiah. That message was a stumbling block to the Jews. They expected the Messiah to be uh, blessed by God. And the idea that he was crucified, that means that he's cursed. And the, the Greeks, the Gentiles... How is the Messiah going to get him do something that gets himself crucified? Makes no sense to them. All folly, verse 24, tells us that something that we would never know. The broader culture of the Jews and the Greeks, while they all rejected Jesus, among them were the called. The power of God worked through the preaching of the gospel, and those who were called 
believed. Believe that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he rose again from the grave. Believe that the Son of God took on flesh, suffered as a sacrifice for your sin, that he was buried, and that he rose again. If you've already believed the gospel, keep believing the gospel as the power of God. So what do you do with the cross? Simple, believe it. Next, what's something else you could do? Preach it. Share it. Share the words. In this passage, Paul grabs our attention and brings us back to the centrality of our existence. The word of the cross is what unites us. The word of the cross is what sets us free from bondage to sin. The word of the cross is what grew the church from uh, 12 to hundreds, to thousands, to millions, maybe a billion plus across the entire world. So keep sharing the word of the cross. When it comes to how you do church, resist the temptation to think like these strategic businessmen who can figure out how to do business in the church, figure out how to convince the world to love Jesus. That's God's work. That's spiritual work. Our job is to preach, to share the message of the cross. God calls, we don't, therefore trust God to change lives through the gospel. Preach the gospel in your bulletin. Preach it on your website. Preach it in your small groups. Preach it in your home. Preach it to yourselves. Borrowing from an old Topeka commercial, preach it seven days a week and on Sundays. So today you've seen that the word across is folly to those who are lost, to those who are perishing. And you've seen that the word of the cross is the power of God to those who are being saved. You've been challenged to take the word of the cross and believe it, to preach it, to share it. Wrestle with that question this week. What do I do with the word of the cross? What do I do with the gospel? Simon Atiba is a journalist from Cameroon, Africa. He's a White House correspondent for his own small media outlet called Today News Africa. He attends White House briefings, but the White House press secretary never calls on him. He's become known for that, that he's never called upon. And Friday, Atiba shared this story on Twitter. He said, my dad had just died. As he lay in a coffin in Africa dressed in white, I looked at him and cried. He was being buried next, the next morning, and some of his friends and neighbors who knew him had come to say goodbye before sending him to the world beyond. Suddenly, I was informed that all the money we had contributed for his funerals had just been stolen by one of the guests. We ran as fast as we could and caught up with her at the bus stop. We opened her bag and found that all the money was inside. And as family members and friends and neighbors were now ready to lynch her, shouting, cursing, expressing disbelief, and saying she deserved death for stealing as the old man lay dead, I protected her. Asked her why she did it, got her a cab to her house, and, and told her to never do it again to another family who would probably kill her. Cameroonian culture said, kill her. Uh, Atiba said, go, sin no more. Where does a Christian find the ability to live in such a counter-cultural way? The word of the cross. The word of the cross empowers us to live like chief sinners who have tasted the goodness of God. The word of the cross, the gospel, empowers us to extend God's grace to others. Father, you are God, we are not. You extend your grace to people. We do not. We trust you to change lives through the gospel, through the message that Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again. We ask that you have your way with us. Remind us by your spirit that your power comes through the gospel, not by anything we can do. Use us for your glory.
today, this week, and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. As we think about uh, the cross, what took place on the cross and so forth, uh, we know that we can't uh, ever repay Christ for what he's done for us, but he's given us all our own cross to bear, and through that, with the whole help of the Holy Spirit, we can bring praise, glory, and honor to God's name. So that's how we want to approach our lives. And in so doing, we're going to close this morning with Hymn of Heaven. So if you'll all stand, I want to remind those that are taking guitar lessons, we will have practice today. And for the youth, we will practice the youth praise team as well.
pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We again have had opportunity <clears throat> to be here together, together in corporate worship. Uh, we've listened to uh, wonderful words that have been brought to us by Casey. We thank you, Lord. We just pray that the Holy Spirit will move through those words in each one of us as we think about the cross. Lord, we also pray that as we go out and about uh, this week, that you would work through each of us to glorify you. That we have opportunity to speak, to reach out to others, that we would take those opportunities. You'd give us strength to do so. Keep us safe, Lord, as we go out and about this week. Bring us back together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>